chapter 4. We're going to be looking there for a few minutes. You know, Romans, Paul is, is, even though he has not yet been to Rome at the time that he wrote the letter of Romans, he was writing to the Christians there in Rome and to the church there. You see, apparently somebody was saved on the day of Pentecost and went back to Rome and started the church there, and that's how they got started. And Paul had never been there, but he wanted to go there. He wanted to go and preach to the Christians at Rome. So what he does is he writes this really long letter to them and tell them, look, I want to come to see you. I'm going to come to see you. I want to preach to you because I think that the Lord wants to do things there at the church in Rome. But he had not been able to go there yet. Now, as we know, looking back at history, Paul eventually did get to Rome, but when he went to Rome, he went there as a prisoner and he waited there until, he was put, uh, until his trial was held and he was put to death. He knew when he got to Rome that he was going to be put to death. But you know, Paul understood the legal process. You see, Paul has said several times, and, and we find it throughout Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, by Old Testament law, you could not convict a person based on the testimony of one witness. You couldn't do it. There are some parts in our law today where uh, you can't, uh, well, I'll just say in law enforcement, and I know this because I was one, uh, you can't arrest somebody. Let's say two people get into an argument. More specifically, let's say a husband and wife get into an argument. She's going to be really mad when you get there. Something will have happened that set her off, okay? And, and you, there might not be any criminal things going on here, okay? Because obviously you can't arrest somebody without what is called probable cause. You have to have a reason to arrest them. All right? But a lot of times in domestic violence, you get there and, and these, uh, these ladies or men, could be men, they will just look at you and say, I want him or her arrested. Well, it, I can't just arrest them because they want them arrested. Just because they're mad with them is not probable cause for me to take them into custody and take their freedom away. And, and people, you know, it's that way in our courts. A lot of times it takes more than one witness to convict. Well, in Old Testament law, it did take more. The law said you couldn't convict a person just with one witness. You had to have two or three witnesses that agreed before you could convict someone of a crime. And Paul understood this because Paul, not only was he a Pharisee in his first life, he was also a lawyer. He studied under Gamaliel. Okay? So he understood the Old Testament law. He understood the process. He understood the procedure and the process through which you could have a good court case. And so he's using this same type of thinking when he is talking to the church at Rome and he's trying to explain to them and really what he's doing is building a case for the gospel of Jesus Christ. What he's doing is saying, listen, there's only one way of salvation. The law is not it. Good works is not it. There's only one way of salvation. And so he starts bringing in witnesses. And last week what we talked about was Abraham. That was his first witness. Now, some of those people who were there in Rome were Jewish people. So when they were reading this letter or hearing it read to them, they were thinking, yeah, but our father Abraham and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but listen, Paul understood, understood that more than anybody. And so he said, I'm going to bring some pretty strong witnesses to the courtroom. <laughs> he says, I'm going to bring, first of all, father Abraham. Now, literally, Abraham was not there, but he brought the stories of Abraham and the testimony of Abraham into bearing so that they would think about it. Where did the nation of Israel start? Well, it started with God, but it came through Abraham. He was the father. Even today, Orthodox Jews talk about Father Abraham, the one who began it all. And so last week when we looked at it, it said that Abraham was a good guy. But he wasn't saved because he was a good guy. He was saved because he believed what God told him. Because he had faith. That was the only reason. 
You see, Paul makes the argument through Abraham's life and through Abraham's testimony that the only way to be saved is by the grace of God through Jesus Christ and belief in Christ's sacrifice. That's the only way to be saved. Period. And so he brings in his first witness. But you know what? Those good Jewish people are sitting there and they're thinking, but you know what? That's just one witness. We can't, we can't be convinced by just one witness. So today, we're going to look at a couple of verses of Scripture where Paul brings in the second witness. And you know what? You start looking at some of the, the people that he's using. He's using the big guys. Okay, he's bringing in the big guns. He says, let's talk about David. David's the greatest king in Israel's history. We're going to talk about David today. Let's all stand together. And we're going to read in Romans chapter 4. We're going to start verse 6 and just read through verse 8. Now remember last week he said, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Listen to what David says. And when Paul says this, he's actually quoting what David wrote in Psalm chapter 32, first two verses. He says, Say, uh, even as David also describeth the blessedness of man. So here he says, okay, I'm going to introduce the second witness, and that's David. And David talked about how man was blessed unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. In other words, you don't have to do anything to be saved. You don't have to keep the law. You don't have to keep the rituals. There's nothing you can do to be good enough to be saved except have faith in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's all you can do. But that's all it takes. He goes on. He says, Say, and this is where he's quoting David, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. That word blessed means happy. You want to know real happiness? You want to know true happiness? Get to the point where God don't see you sin anymore. <coughs> David said, that's a happy man. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would teach us today. Help us to understand your word, Lord. Help us to hear you speak this morning. And Lord, may we open our hearts to what you have for us. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. David, David was the greatest king in Israel's history. That's why Paul talks about David and said, look, you don't believe what I tell you, listen to what Abraham said. And now he's saying, listen to what David said. That's why he quoted Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. He said, don't take my word for it, listen to the witness. David was the greatest king in Israel's history. Now, if you look at all the great uh, figures in the Bible, the great men, obviously the greatest the most important man in all of Scripture was Jesus. I mean, that's it. he's number one. Always has been, always will be. All right, Because the whole book is about God's plan of salvation, and God's plan of salvation was Jesus. And so he is the greatest, most historical figure. But if you're talking to the Jewish people, look, the second greatest figure in Scripture is Abraham. Because without Abraham, there wouldn't have been a Jewish nation. And so, hey, here you've got God, and God talked to Abraham, and now I got me, you know. But there's a lot of people between Abraham and me. And there are great people. They have the prophets. But the greatest king that Israel ever had was David. So I guess probably to the Jewish people, the most important person in Scripture that we know is Christ. The second most important is Abraham, and the third most important is David. So Paul's being real smart here when he's making his case. He's bringing in people that they will listen to. Abraham is the most important, but David is the next. But what was David to Israel? You stop and think about everything that there was about David. Why was he the greatest king in Israel's history? Well, he was definitely a step up from what they had to begin with, and that was Saul, who wound up killing himself because he made bad choices. And he did not follow God in the end. He followed what was right in his own eyes, which is never a good thing for any of us, even today. That's why I ask all the time, every decision you make every day, do you pray about it before you make it? 
And it could be something as simple as, where am I going to eat today? <laughs> you know? I mean, seriously. Folks, we ought to be praying about every decision we make. Why was David the greatest king in Israel's history? Well, stop and think about the story of David. Number one, he was a shepherd boy. But he was no ordinary shepherd boy. This young one wasn't scared of nothing. Not a thing. And I, you know, we, we were out there yesterday. I don't think I told Darth was this, but we were out there yesterday at the shoot, and of course, Luke was with me. And Josh was out there, and of course, you know, Josh and I, we were oohing and on over these guns these guys were shooting and everything. And Luke, he found him a couple of buddies from school, and he was out there in the field just rolling around playing, being boys, you know. And so I, 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 it was kind of my job to keep an eye on him. So I looked around, and he mm -hmm. wasn't where he was, and I said, oh, let me go find him. So I took off back there, and I got back to where him and the other boys were, and uh, thankfully they had jumped up in the back of my truck, so I, you know, they were... <coughs> But I was just standing there watching him, and this lady came up and she said, does Luke belong to you? I said, well, sort of. He's my grandson. And she said, oh, okay. She said, well, I didn't know really who to go find, but said a while ago he was out there with my two, and, I, and they go to school together. And, and uh, I was kind of proud of this. But anyway, they said, uh, you know, all of a sudden I looked up, and Luke was standing there, and both my boys grabbed him, and they threw him down, and they jumped on top of him. And I thought, oh, no, and I took off toward him, and about that time, he just went whoop, and he was up on top and had them down on the ground. And I thought, that's my boy. <laughs> David was no ordinary shepherd boy. You stop thinking about the stories you read in Scripture. He was out there, and, and one day this lion came up to go to get his daddy's sheep. And David said, you know what? I ain't going to let this lion get my daddy's flocks. And he killed that lion. And he was a boy. And it said another time he was out there and there was this bear and he killed this bear. But you know what? The story everybody remembers is when his daddy said, hey, your, boy, your brothers are off at war. Here's some food. Take it to them. And he went out there and he was appalled by what he saw. He was a young boy. And he got out there and there was old Goliath standing there and he was a giant. He was a big man. And he was making fun of the armies of Israel, saying, hey, y'all come out here, one-on-one, whoever can beat me there, God, is, is supreme. And David looked around and said, why hadn't somebody gone out there and taken care of him? And they said, are you kidding? Boy, hush, you're foolish. Look how big he is. Yeah, but God Almighty's got this in his hands. God's going to take care of this, and nobody would go. Saul the king wouldn't even go out there because they were afraid. David said, shoot, hang on a minute. And Saul said, him, put on this armor. It was too big for David. He said, man, get this stuff off me. God's going to protect me. And he went out there and he picked up a few rocks and he had his sling and he went out there and he looked at that giant. He wasn't scared one bit and said, hey, God's got your number, buddy. Whoop! And there he went. And this little boy went out there and picked up that giant's big old sword and chopped his head off. And Israel won a great victory. Isn't it amazing how sometimes God can work through children who are willing to let Him, but adults are too hard-headed to understand that God's got it. All you got to do is be faithful. David was a shepherd boy, yeah. But he, he represented the working class, but he showed them how to follow God. He was a musician. Lord, he, you know, the Psalms, a lot of that was music that David wrote. He loved music. He was a soldier. He started being a soldier when he was a boy when he conquered Goliath, but that kept going throughout his life. He was the greatest king. He was a priest. You say, wait a minute, he wasn't a priest, he was king. There's a difference. Let me tell you something. He was more of a priest than the priests were. You know why? Because David said that God wanted a broken and contrite heart more than he wanted blood sacrifice. David understood better than the priest did what God wanted. God said, look, you can come to church all you want to. I don't care about you going and going through some ritual. I want your heart to be in it. Let me ask you something. Is your heart in it? You get up and come to church every Sunday morning, is your heart in it? You know what? I'm going to confess something to you. There was time in my life when I, I had to get up and come to church. I mean, Daddy was a preacher. That was just, you were going to be in church, period. 
But there were days I would sit in church and my heart wasn't in it. My heart wasn't in it. Is your heart in it? Folks, let me tell you something. David says, you can go through all the ritual you want to. You can go through all the ceremony you want to. But if your heart's not in the right place, it's not doing you any good. None whatsoever. David was a priest and he was a poet. He was the greatest king in Israel's history. But I want you to notice something. When Paul was talking about Abraham, he said, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. When you read that, you get a positive image? Of course you do. Because he uses the word credited. Credited means a positive. Something is done for you, is added to you. Yeah, it was a very positive statement. But when David makes his statement and Paul quotes it, he, he's really talking about something that's kind of negative. But it's important that we look at the negative sometimes, isn't it? What am I talking about? Well, when he says this, he says, Even as David also described the blessedness of man unto whom God imputes righteousness without works, say, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven. Man, David starts off and he says, Hey, you bunch of sinners. Now when you think about that, does that bring forth a positive thought or a negative thought? Most people, when you say when you say you're a sinner, they take that kind of personal and they get mad because, to be honest with you, most people don't think they are. But David says it's important to call it like it is. Sin is sin and it's wrong. David said, look, you can be happy if your sins are covered. If your sins are taken away. It's the negative. Folks, why does David do this? I think it's because he understood human nature. Why did he use this kind of negative wording? Because he understood human nature. Now you stop and think. You know, the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. The Bible says that humans are humans throughout history. David understood it, so that you know what that tells me? That people back then were kind of like people today. Alright? They, they, David understood human nature and humans don't think they got anything to be ashamed of because, hey, I'm not a bad person. I've talked to so many people, I ask them, hey, where you go to church? You know, I started, I got to tell y'all something. I, I went to a little old store over there to get me something to eat this morning and I walked in there and one of the ladies that worked in there, she walked up and she looked at me and she said, you're a preacher, aren't you? And I said, what are you talking about? I always, I, you know, it's, it's a lot more interesting if you don't just say yes, you know. <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? She said, you're a preacher, aren't you? I said, what makes you think I'm a preacher? She said, I know you're wearing a suit, but that ain't got nothing to do with it. I said, what are you talking about? She said, you're a preacher. You, I can see it. And I said, how can you see it? She said, you are a preacher. I said, yeah, I am. <laughs> but I want to know what you're talking about. She said, look at it. Let me tell you something. <laughs> Before I came back to preaching the Word of God, my wife continually had to tell me, happy thoughts. Happy thoughts. It's been a long time since she had to say that. Amen. Let me tell you something. Thank God. We all carry this stuff. David understood, understood human nature. He understood that most people, even today, you talk to people all along. You talk to people today and you try to tell them about Jesus. Hey, where do you go to church? Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about our church and what we stand for, which is Jesus. You know, I mean, and, and they say, oh, that's, well, that's cool. But why are you talking to me? I'm a good person. I don't need that. Oh, yes, you do. <laughs> Oh, yes, you do. But they can't understand that. They don't see that. They don't think that they're in a wrong relationship with God. They think that everything's okay between them and God. You remember Evangelism Explosion. Some of you remember that program that was written. You know what? 
And, and they would teach you to witness by starting out and asking somebody, if you were to die today and get to the gates of heaven and God were to ask you why he should let you into his heaven, what would you say? Now this may shock you. R.C. Sproul. Some of y'all know who I'm talking about. Great theologian, great evangelist. R.C. Sproul looked at his adult son right when evangelism explosion was coming out. And he asked him that question. He said, son, if you were to die today, and you were to get to the gates of heaven, and God were to ask you why he should let you into his heaven, what would you say? And R.C. Sproul's own son looked at him and said, well, I died, didn't I? Now stop and think about that. There are a lot of people out there that think their only qualification for getting into heaven is dying. You know what? What was that movie? I think it was a kid's movie. It might not have been a kid's movie. I don't know. There was a movie entitled this, All Dogs Go to Heaven. You know what? That's the idea some people have about us as human beings. That everybody's going to go to heaven. All we got to do is die. You know, everybody gets a trophy. Y'all want me to tell you how I feel about that? <laughs> <laughs> Folks, let me tell you something. People have a very wrong idea. They think they don't need saving. They think that everything's alright. And all they got to do to go to heaven is die. And folks, let me tell you something. David understood that. That's why he said, we need to be telling people they ain't okay. You know, there was this, this book written in the 70s. And it was a psychologist called, I'm okay, you're okay. It had to do with all that analysis and all that good stuff, you know, that I have studied and have gotten away, gotten thrown it away. Just throw it away, okay? Let me tell you something. You ain't okay. If you hadn't had it, Jesus come into your heart, you're not okay. You may be a good person. You may be a moral person. You may have everything you need, but you're not okay. And yes, one day you will die. And when you die, you're going to find out that dying is not the only thing necessary to get you into God's heaven. Yeah. It's going to get you somewhere, but it ain't going to get you to heaven unless you've got Jesus in your heart. Folks, let me tell you something. David speaks of transgressions. He talks about sin. He talks about it being a burden. What is the burden of sin? You want me to, you want me to tell you how we say it today? It's called guilt. It's called guilt. You ever felt so guilty about something you just about died to? You got it off your chest and told somebody... You know, why, you know why we feel that way? You know why that is? Because God, God's Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. You know what conviction <laughs> is? It's feeling guilty about it. Folks need to feel guilty about their sin. And that's not being hard, and I don't mean to put people down. You know, but nowadays we live in a society where, oh, we can't make anybody feel bad about themselves. Oh, yeah, we can. And we should. Folks, let me tell you something. Because when we feel bad and we feel guilt, it motivates us to get rid of the guilt and to get to feeling better. And guess what? We wind up being better people for it. David talks about the burden, the guilt of sin. I think it was Donald Barnhouse early in his ministry. He wasn't very old, early 20s said that he had a woman come to him after one of his meetings and she said, I need to talk to you. This lady was in her, I think, in her 60s. And she started talking and she said, I have carried this for a long, long time, but the guilt is crushing me and I have to tell it. And she confessed to killing a man 40 years earlier. She had gotten away with it. It turns out that this man was a boarder in her mother and father's house and that he had snuck into her room and abused her one night. And she got really angry about it. And so she slipped into his room and turned the gas and didn't light the pilot. Turned on the gas but didn't light the pilot. And he died during the night. And the police came and investigated and they ruled it accidental death because the wind must have blown the pilot light out and the gas filled the room, and he died. And this lady had carried this guilt for over 40 years. And Barnhouse prayed with her so that she could get relief from that guilt. And folks, you know what? We've never killed anybody. 
but maybe maybe we have assassinated someone's character with our lips and our tongue. Same thing. Do you feel guilty? You know what? Most of us carry some guilt about something. We we most all of us have guilt about something. And we carry it around when we don't have to. We don't have to carry it around because God can forgive it. You know what? There's a lot of men. I even had people tell me, I've had businessmen tell me, son, you can't be honest and make money in business. You've got to be a crook. And I'm thinking, what? How does no. That's probably more true than I like to believe. But it's not true in all of it. But you have some form of guilt. You know what? I have talked to a lot of people. I've talked to some ladies that have had abortion. And they thought, this is no big deal. I can do this. But down the road, the guilt was crushing. You know what? They're told, oh, that's not a baby. That's just tissue that needs to be removed. Let me tell you something. I sat there yesterday afternoon for about three hours in a recliner. I had a bottle right there. I had a little thing to throw over my shoulder to burp with. I mean, I was, I was papa yesterday. I sat there yesterday afternoon and I held her and I looked at her. She don't weigh the seven pounds. She's done. And she'd look at me, and she'd reach with them hands. I mean, she's starting to act like a little person now, you know? And the whole time I'm sitting there thinking, how, how could anyone kill a child? But there are women, millions of them, that are walking around, riding around, going to work every day, living their life miserable because of the guilt that they carry from having an abortion. You know what? They even go to counselors. They go to counselors and the counselors tell them, look, you know, everybody does this. You're not the only one that's done, done, that's done this. There's nothing to be ashamed of. You didn't do anything wrong. And then they finally look at them and say, well, if you really feel that much guilt about it, you have to forgive yourself. Wait a minute, what did you just say? You've got to forgive yourself? Yourself? How do you forgive yourself? You can't forgive yourself. Only God can forgive you. You can't forgive yourself. Look, counselors even try to tell them things. Counselors even look at them and say, I forgive you. So what? You can't forgive that sin. Only God can forgive that sin. And folks, it doesn't matter who you are and it doesn't matter what you've done. If there is guilt there, it's because God is convicting you of the sin and the only person that can take the guilt and the conviction away is God. Yes. That's what David says. David says, blessed is the man whose sin is covered, whose sin God has taken away. But you notice God was central in both of those. God has to take the sin away. You know those people that wind up with all this guilt, they wind up in a not a very good situation. <laughs> they wind up as alcoholics or drug addicts or ending their own life. And it doesn't have to be that way because God stands ready to forgive them. They need to be told that what they did was wrong. You know what? A woman who kills her own child needs to be told, you murdered a baby, and it was your baby. And you ought to feel guilty about it. But let me tell you something. God can forgive you and restore you. They need to hear that what they did was wrong. But they also need to hear that it can be all right because of God Amen. through His Son, Jesus Christ. There's three things that stick out to me and then we're done. David right here said, number one, his sin was forgiven. You see, the Greek word forgiven 
uh, that's used for forgiven right here means to send away. To send away. In other words, it's gotten rid of. It's not, it's not there anymore because God takes it and sends it away. <laughs> we were talking this morning right there in the hall and I told, uh, I, I told Miss Judy and Beth, I said, you know, probably my favorite hymn that's ever been written it was written by a man named Horatio Spafford. And he wrote that song after he got word that his wife and children who were traveling from England back to the United States, that their ship had gone down and everybody on board was lost. He lost his wife and his children. And it was devastating to him. But he got on a boat that was going back to England and he told the captain, I don't care what time it is, when we get to the point where that ship went down, I want to be on the deck. I want to be looking. I want you to come get me. And the captain did that. And Horatio Spafford stood out there on the deck of that ship looking out over the water where he knew his wife and children were at the bottom in their grave. And he began to write. And the third verse of his song, he said this, My sin Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I carry it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, <laughs> oh, my soul. It is well with my soul. You got guilt? God can take it away. You have sin? God can take it away. Christ shed His blood to take it away. David said, praise God, my sin is forgiven. He also said, but my sin is covered. Now I want you to notice something about David. So here's part of David's life that we don't talk about much anymore. And we ought to. Because David talked about it. Listen, David knew something about sin in your life and carrying guilt, didn't he? I mean, he was an adulterer, he was a murderer, and you know, when he did all of that, what did he do? He tried to hide it. He tried to cover it up. You know what? You can try to cover it up and justify it any way you want to justify it, but you can't do it. Be sure your sins will find you out. The Bible says it. And David knew that. But David still tried to cover it up. He tried to cover up his sin. But you know what? You may cover up your sin. You may get away with it here on this earth. You might, whatever it is that you're involved with, you may get away with it. You may be real good at covering up. But let me tell you something, the guilt's still going to be there and the burden is still going to be there. You can't cover that up. Now when David right there in Psalm 32 and that Paul quoted here in Romans 4, when he was talking about his sins are covered, he ain't talking about covered up. There's a difference what David was talking about. You remember on the Day of Atonement. See, the way Israel was forgiven of their sins, for God to look past their sin. On the Day of Atonement, the priests made sacrifice in, uh, at the temple there. And when they made the sacrifice, they would take the blood of that sacrificial animal and the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. And on the top was a throne called the Mercy Seat. And the priest would take hyssop and dip in that blood and sprinkle that blood over the mercy seat. And God says, when I see the covering of the blood, I don't see the sins. Now folks, listen. That is a perfect picture of what Christ's blood on the cross does for us. When we accept the sacrifice that Christ made and are covered by the blood of Christ, God sees the blood of His Son. He doesn't see the sin. The sin is covered. That's what David was talking about. He said, yeah, my sins are forgiven. But not only are they forgiven, God can't see them because they're covered. And he says that his sin was not counted against him. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. In other words, will not count it against you. He says, I'm forgiven. <laughs> but He's forgiven 
forever. Stop thinking about it. How long can you live with guilt? Somebody for a long time. Can you live with it for eternity? Because we're forever beings. We were, we were given a soul by God, and that soul will last for eternity. It just depends on where that soul is going to spend eternity. How long can you carry guilt? How long can you deal with the sin? Paul says, look, there's one way to get rid of it. And that's at the foot of the cross where Jesus died. Father, I pray today that each and every one of those here have come to a saving knowledge of you. Lord, I pray that they have had their sins covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. But Lord, if they have not, I pray that today that you would burden them until they come and have the sin taken away. Heavenly Father, for those of us who are here and who have experienced the wonderful forgiveness that you offer, Heavenly Father, May that forgiveness and may that peace and joy that is in our heart, may it spur us on to greater service for you, to tell others, to share with others what you've done in our lives. Father, I pray that your will would be done, that you would have your will in your will for us in your precious and holy name.